October 24, 1960, the Baikonur Cosmodrome. The desolate steppes of Kazakhstan were freezing, swept by a bitter wind. But the atmosphere inside the launch complex was burning hot with political pressure. Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev was currently in New York at the United Nations, banging his shoe on the desk and promising to bury the West. He needed a weapon to back up his threats. He had demanded a gift for the upcoming anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution, the successful launch of a new, terrifying weapon. That weapon was the R-16, the first true Soviet intercontinental ballistic missile capable of striking the United States. It was massive, standing over 100 feet tall, a glistening needle of destruction. But to the men working on it, it wasn't just a rocket. It was a chemical bomb waiting to go off. The R-16 didn't use safe cryogenic fuels like liquid oxygen. It used a volatile, corrosive mix of unsymmetrical dimethylhydrazine and nitric acid. The technicians called it devil's venom. These chemicals were hypergolic, meaning they didn't need a spark to ignite. If they touched each other, they exploded instantly. They were so toxic that a few drops on human skin could be fatal. And now, under the glare of floodlights, the R-16 was fully fueled, sitting on Pad 41, groaning under the weight of 160 tons of this liquid death. The man in charge was Marshal Mitrofan Nedelin, the head of the Soviet Strategic Rocket Forces. He was a war hero, a man used to giving orders and having them obeyed. But he was under immense pressure from the Kremlin. The launch had already been delayed. The technical systems were glitching. Safety protocols dictated that if a fully fueled rocket had a major fault, the fuel had to be drained, the rocket neutralized, and the launch scrubbed for weeks. But Nadellin didn't have weeks. He didn't even have days. He reportedly told the engineers, the government is waiting. Do not make me shame us. On October 23rd, the day before the disaster, a leak was discovered in the fuel lines. Nitric acid began dripping down the side of the rocket. The fumes were so strong, they ate through the insulation. The engineers, led by the brilliant designer Mikhail Yangel, knew the safe protocol. Abort. Drain the tanks. Send the rocket back to the factory. But Nadellin refused. He ordered the technicians to seal the leak while the rocket was fully fueled on the pad. It was madness. It was like welding a gas tank while smoking a cigarette. By the evening of October 24th, the situation on Pad 41 had turned into a chaotic circus. To save time, Nadellin ordered that the pre-launch checks be done out of sequence. Safety locks were bypassed. The pyrotechnic membranes, the explosive valves that allowed fuel to flow to the engines, were ruptured intentionally to speed things up. The rocket was now live, a loaded gun with the safety catch filed off. Usually, during a dangerous test like this, the top brass sits in a concrete bunker miles away. But Nadellin wanted to show his confidence. He wanted to shame the engineers who were nervous. So he took a folding chair and sat it down on the tarmac just 15 meters, less than 50 feet, from the base of the rocket. Seeing the marshal sitting there, the other top scientists, designers, and generals felt compelled to stand with him. Over 150 of the Soviet Union's best minds were clustered around the base of the ticking bomb. At 6.45 p.m., a technician in the control bunker made a fatal mistake. Due to the rushed, out-of-order procedures, a switch on the program current distributor was left in the wrong position. When he reset it, it sent a stray electrical pulse into the rocket's firing command circuit. It bypassed the first stage entirely 
and went straight to the second stage. High above the heads of the gathered crowd, the second stage engine roared to life. The flame shot directly down into the fuel tanks of the first stage below it. The result was instantaneous and apocalyptic. The flame from the second stage sliced through the fully fueled first stage like a blowtorch through butter. 160 tons of hypergolic propellant ignited in a fraction of a second. It wasn't just an explosion. It was a chemical sun being born on the tarmac. A fireball, bright enough to be seen for miles, expanded outward in a wave of pure heat, reaching temperatures of over 3,000 degrees Celsius. For the men standing near the pad, there was no time to run, no time to scream, perhaps not even time to realize they were dead. Marshal Nadellen, the war hero who refused to be afraid, was vaporized instantly. He was sitting just meters from the epicenter. When the rescue teams eventually combed the site, all they found of the commander of the strategic rocket forces was the melted gold star of his Hero of the Soviet Union medal and a set of keys. He had been erased from existence. Those further away faced a fate arguably worse than death. The blast wave knocked them down, but it was the fuel that hunted them. The devil's venom, the nitric acid and hydrazine, rained down like napalm. It didn't just burn, it chemically dissolved anything it touched. The tarmac of the launch pad melted into a sticky black trap. Men tried to run, but their boots sank into the boiling asphalt, holding them in place as the fire overtook them. The security fence, designed to keep spies out, became a cage. Panicked engineers and soldiers ran toward the perimeter only to find the gates locked. They were trapped against the wire as the poisonous fumes and flames washed over them. The cameras that had been set up to record the historic launch instead recorded a massacre. The footage, which remained top secret for decades, shows figures running out of the fire, burning alive until they simply collapse. Miraculously, the man who had designed the rocket, Mikhail Yangel, survived. Just moments before the explosion, he had stepped away from the front row to sneak a cigarette in a specialized smoking bunker a safe distance away. The addiction that should have killed him saved his life. He heard the roar, felt the ground shake, and ran out to see his life's work turning his friends into ash. As he watched the inferno, Yangle reportedly had to be physically restrained from running back into the fire to save his team. He collapsed, sobbing, I am to blame. I should have been there with them. The fire raged for hours. The chemicals were so toxic that rescue crews had to wear gas masks just to approach the perimeter. When the flames finally died down, the Baikonur Cosmodrome looked like the surface of a dead planet. Over 100 people were dead, some estimates say up to 120, including the top tier of Soviet rocket science, the best guidance engineers, and the military leadership. The brain trust of the Soviet space program had been wiped out in a single afternoon. Then came the second tragedy, the silence. Nikita Khrushchev, furious and embarrassed, ordered a total cover-up. The Soviet Union could not admit that its space program was a disaster waiting to happen. The families of the victims were told that their husbands and fathers had died in a plane crash. Nadellen was given a state funeral with full honors, but the cause of death was listed as an aviation accident. The survivors were sworn to secrecy under threat of execution. The destruction of the R-16 and the massacre on the launch pad simply didn't happen. It wasn't until 1989, nearly 30 years later, that the Soviet magazine Agoniok finally published the truth. The world gasped at the scale of the horror. 
The Nederland catastrophe is now recognized as the deadliest launch pad accident in the history of spaceflight. The legacy of that day is profound. The loss of so many brilliant minds stalled the Soviet moon program. While they eventually put Gagarin in space, the heavy lift rockets to get to the moon fell behind. The Americans, proceeding with slower, safer testing, eventually took the lead. But perhaps the most chilling legacy is the ghost of Baikonur. To this day, Russian cosmonauts observe strange rituals before a launch, and no launches are ever scheduled on October 24th. It is a black day at the Cosmodrome. The pads fall silent, and the engineers remember the day the sky burned and the price of arrogance was paid in blood.